more than 20. I just got a, a prompt, maybe you did too, that is being that the session is being recorded, but I think we know that. And if you see at the top left of your screen, you see a little couple of icons in the word recording. But as I was saying, as, as has been the case for over 20 years, the Winter Lecture Series has been sponsored in part, at least by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. But for our financial support, the program is brought to you with the support from Humanities Nebraska, formerly known as the Nebraska Humanities Council. This is a statewide nonprofit organization helping Nebraskans explore what connects us and what makes us human with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, and I hope you do, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska with a contribution. We also partner with OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which aids us with publicity by weekly email announcements to its over 1,300 members, putting uh, the winter lecture series in course schedules and mentioning it in the many OLLI classes that are offered. Please consider the numerous OLLI courses offered over five terms each year. Uh, the majority of the people on the Winter Lecture, uh, City, uh, the Winter Lecture Series Planning Committee are OLLI members. And for more information, including the catalog of current and forthcoming courses, you can find that on the internet at OLLI, O-L-L-I, at UNL.edu. We expect each of the four sessions to end at 8.30 p.m. Central Time. If you miss a lecture, uh, each one will be posted within about a week, thanks to Bob, on the Unitarian Church YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash Unitarian Church of Lincoln. That's youtube.com slash Unitarian Church of Lincoln. As you think of questions during this lecture and in the forthcoming lectures, please put them in the chat function. If appropriate, at the end of each lecture, questions may also be asked by opening uh, your microphone on the device you're viewing. Uh, the moderator, Bob, will let you know about this at the lecture's end, whether we will he will field the questions uh, from the chat exclusively or uh, have people speak the questions out loud by uh, unmuting uh, on your computer. But for now, uh, I think Bob has unmuted everybody. If not, be sure you're unmuted and also be sure that uh, your your video is, is off. Uh, when uh, when it's time to uh, to ask a question, you'll be able to just click on the mute icon on the bottom left of your screen, and uh, you'll be able to speak, and everybody will be able to hear you. If you're not already on the list to the, receive the Winter Lecture Series reminders, go to the Winter Lecture Series website, which is www.unitarianlincoln, not Unitarian Church, but unitarianlincoln.org slash winter lecture series and now uh, on with the show tonight's uh tonight's uh speaker as i mentioned is dr thomas or tim worstelman uh he's been with the university of nebraska lincoln since 2003 after coming here after an already distinguished career at uh, cornell university in the history department uh he is the elwood n and Catherine Thompson, Distinguished Professor of Modern World History here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, he, Tim grew up in North Carolina, and he earned his bachelor's degree, Phi Beta Kappa, from Stanford University. He then went on to graduate school at Duke University, where he earned his master's and his PhD. His research has primarily focused on the intersection of the United States domestic history and international history. His first book titled, Apartheid's Reluctant Uncle, colon, the United States and Southern Africa in the Early Cold War, published by Oxford University Press in 1993, 
won a prize from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations for the best first book on American diplomatic history. He's also published The Cold War and the Color Line, colon, American Race Relations in the Global Arena. That was published by the Harvard University Press in 2001. And he's co-authored with several other people a U.S. history textbook, Created Equal, A Social and Political History of the United States. But that was published first in, in 2003, and it's already been so successful that it's, it's been through five editions. In 2012, Princeton University Press published his next book entitled The 1970s, A, Glo A New Global History from Civil Rights to Economic Inequality. In 2015, Professor Borstelman served as president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations and the same year, he won their prize uh, for uh, he he won uh, a prize from the University of Nebraska for outstanding teaching in the humanities. In 2021, he won a book award for his most recent book, "Just Like Us: The American Struggle to Understand Foreigners," which was published by Columbia University Press. He's currently completing an autobiographical set of essays tentatively titled, but not for certain, Chalk to Zoom, A Life in History and Teaching. As you will soon see and hear, Dr. Borselman is not only an extra extraordinarily knowledgeable in American diplomatic history, but he's also quite an engaging speaker. And with that, I'm really pleased and honored to present to you Dr. Tim Borstelman. Thank you so much, Peter. It's really a pleasure, an honor to be here, to be invited. I'm, I'm just delighted. Um, thanks to, to Dave Forsyth and to the rest of the committee that put this lecture series together as well, um, as you, Peter, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to Bob for his technical support, without which backward looking people like me with ancient technological habits wouldn't do so well. So it's great to have, have his support. Um, and I'm delighted by the interest of all of you out there um, in, in your Zoom boxes uh, and your willingness to climb on board here, at least digitally tonight. You know, Zoom's got its limitations as we all know. Um, and, and the main one for me is that I can't see you uh, and I can't interact with you and that's tough when you're a teacher like me, I mean, I've been teaching for more than 40 years now, and it's uh, it's an art that doesn't work very well if you don't have an interaction. So, so I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna presume that you're smiling at least if I slip a joke in here or something like that. The other thing I should warn you about as, as just as I start off is that we're, that my task at hand today is pretty different from the other three speakers you're gonna have based on at least what I can see of what they'll do because they have specific topics on China and Russia and, and US polarization in those various places. Whereas I've got to instead do a kind of a big overview of more than 200 years of US foreign relations history around the issue of partisanship and bipartisanship. And that's, um, that's a tall order. I think of it as sort of like a drive-by slaughter of, of American history because it's, it's impossible to do it justice. So think of it this way. It's more like I'll be doing a kind of well, we will be doing together, a 30,000 foot high view, a sort of eagle's eye view of this big st overarching story of the US and the world and how partisanship at home works with that. While at the same time, we're gonna swoop in like an eagle for prey, for particularly uh, interesting nuggets that I want us to look at more closely and then we'll swoop back out and get back up at the 30,000 foot perspective. So that, that's the goal here. And, and I guess by way of trying to telegraph the story from the beginning, because you've got a question mark in your series title, Polarization in America, Is Foreign Policy Different? You know, the usual answer of academics is yes and no. And, and in this case, I think the answer is more no than yes. That is, uh, foreign policy is not immune in any way from what happens uh, on the home front, that there's constants you know, back and forth between the two, as we will see. 
Now, uh, I'm also gonna, gonna try to uh, share my screen here, which is always a touch and go process for those of us who are not as technologically sophisticated as Bob, but hopefully you're seeing uh, my slides here, um, including this opening slide of a published version of George Washington's farewell address um, from the 1790s, from 1797, as he, uh, it's, this one's published a few years later. Um, and in this address, he gives, uh, makes clear a, an enduring theme of the American relationship to the outside world. And it's, it's crucial. It's the theme of no tangling alliances. That's the phrase he uses. And the United States, in the broadest sense, again, to remind you of the 30,000 foot high view of it, goes from being originally a small set of, of English colonies hanging on barely to the shore of the eastern edge of the North American continent to becoming an independent nation, but one committed, as Washington put it, to staying out of European affairs, to not having entangling alliances with other powers, especially with other great powers, to be an independent nation, not a monarchy like the others, a democratic republic, a novelty, a slave-owning democratic republic, mind you, but a democratic republic in a way that was not true of the other great powers. But this path goes from that little tiny group of colonies to this new nation built there in Philadelphia to, by the 20th century, a kind of globally dominant position and even a kind of global police. And that's an amazing trajectory and one that we're gonna to try to keep in mind. And as we do this, another early theme I wanna to emphasize to you is that Americans, for the most part, that is most average citizens, uh, like most other peoples of any nation, are not very interested in foreign relations. I mean, you guys are weirdos, would be the simple way of putting it, because you, you're actually interested, which is great. And I'm, I'm delighted about that, of course. But like most people, most Americans focus on their immediate lives. And state politics is kind of remote. National politics is very remote. And international affairs is the farthest away of all. So my hat is off to you for being part of this session here, but it's worth remembering that the arguments about foreign policy are usually taking place among a pretty small uh, elite group of Americans. And this is, uh, this is the case with some exceptions. And they're, they're more than just the ones I've mentioned here, but I wanna outline a couple just to remind us that there are ways in which foreign policy hits home for Americans, gains traction in their daily lives. And one of these has to do with land, particularly Western lands, um, uh, until the late 1800s, the whole business of moving into new lands uh, seized from indigenous peoples in the American West, uh, because indigenous peoples, uh, including here in Nebraska, were, of course, foreign nations. This was a form of foreign policy, the business of expanding across the continent, even though we sometimes call it Western history or think of it as sort of a separate phase of American history, but it's about dealing with the rest of the world, starting with the very near West, including the lands that we now uh, uh, stand on here in Nebraska. In another way, uh, people, Americans, average Americans are very much affected is by trade with other nations um, as workers with the flows of goods and, and services. And a third is tourism and the whole business of being consumers of other, you know, of other societies as uh, tourists who, who go abroad. These are sort of short-term flows of people, you might think of them. And then a fourth would be international migration, which is sort of long-term flows of other people, of peoples moving across borders as opposed to tourism. Uh, and so in at least these ways, uh, foreign affairs is not something remote. And the title of this talk that I was given, Bipartisanship in American Diplomatic History, it is a giveaway of a, of a kind of language that lingers from an earlier way of writing American history, which was to call it diplomatic history implied that it was sort of diplomats talking to diplomats. So this would be the State Department talking to the foreign office in London or in Paris or in Beijing. Uh, but in fact, the field has come to, in, among historians of American foreign relations, uh, the field has come to be richer and more complex. And today, it's usually described with terms like U.S. international history, or U.S. and the world, or U.S. in the world. 
There's a whole series of different ways that people try to capture the diversity of the ways that Americans and other peoples engage with each other. It's continuous and it's multifaceted. It ranges across a remarkable diversity of people's uh, aspects of people's lives. Now, uh, domestic politics and, and well, I guess I should, I, maybe while I hold on to this, just one last uh, point would be to remind you that by 1913, by the cusp of uh, World War I, the U.S. had already become the largest economy in the world, and, and it had the, was also the largest trading nation in the world. And it was a major provider and recipient of international tourists, for example, and it was also the largest uh, recipient of immigrants from abroad. In fact, by today, you know, we have uh, roughly 44 to 45 million people who live in the United States uh, permanently who are not, were not born here. So the U.S. has a spectacular record of receiving people. And sometimes we forget just how large that scale is. And, and so it's impossible, therefore, to separate domestic politics and culture uh, from international affairs. They just overflow into each other, even when Americans uh, try to stay out of international engagements, which is another theme that we'll see a few more times here this evening. Uh, they tend to get drawn into them nonetheless because of the, the U.S.'s remarkably dominant role by the 20th century in all kinds of international cultural engagement, trade and economic engagements, investments, political leadership, military alliances, and, and, and all kinds of other issues and problems like climate change, the one we'll get to at the end today. Now, the U.S. has always had, in terms of bipartisanship, it's always had a system of political parties, except for the very first years of Washington's administration. But quickly you get an evolution uh, into different groupings of political agents and voters and, and with different interests. And originally this was the, the, the Federalists on the one hand uh, and the Democratic Republicans on the other associated with Thomas Jefferson, uh, Hamilton with the Federalists. Uh, this evolves in the 1820s, especially the 1830s and 1840s into the Whigs on the one hand uh, and the Democrats associated with Andrew Jackson on the other. And then uh, eventually by the 1850s, it begins to shape up as the two-party system that we recognize today of Republicans and Democrats. And they've shifted a great deal, as most of you will know that you know today's Republicans don't really resemble um, Republicans from even the 1950s much less you know, further back in the 1850s and 1860s. They're, they're, they've changed in all kinds of ways. But the, maybe the more important thing to say about these parties is not the formal designation that they have, but rather uh, how each has dissent within it, that there's dissent all the way along uh, through this whole history within each party, dissent from the left on foreign policy and dissent from the right on foreign policy, from isolationism, or isolationists, although I put that term in quotations, uh, on the left and on the right, and internationalists who were sometimes on the left and sometimes on the right. Uh, and even those terms left and right, of course, are complicated in ways we could maybe talk about later. Uh, dissent during wartime often was the most fraught of all, the one that created the most anxiety, particularly in World War I, and led to the Har harassment and locking up uh, and murder of an awful lot of people um, along the path to trying to put together a national consensus. Now, if we slip into the mainstream of American history uh, at the birth of the United States, we have to remember that the U.S. was born out of an international conflict between Britain and France. I mean, we, we tell the story, most of us, as a you know, kind of the U.S., seizing its own independence from Britain, but this could not have happened, at least not in the way it did, and certainly not as successfully, if France had not been uh, such an eager and important provider of support to the United States. Britain and France had been at war with each other, um, and of course the, United, the, the British colonies that became the United States were very much part of that British empire fighting against the French empire uh, in the North American uh, theater of a global war between the British and, and French. So this American revolution that unfolds uh, between 1776 and 17, well, really 1774, and then the fighting in 1775 and Declaration of Independence in 1776 on up to the, uh, the Battle of Yorktown and the British surrender in 1781. This unfolds in a way that you can see here with this map, 
which creates a much smaller British footprint in uh, the North American continent. Uh, and it's one that is a revolution that is deeply important and remarkable for how much it promises a, a post-monarchical, more democratic, more Republican, little r, little d, uh, future for the world. It's a model to the rest of the world. And other nations are quoting the American Declaration of Independence right up deep into the 20th century, as we will see. So the American Revolution is, is terribly important, but it's not the most revolutionary of the revolutions. And it's worth remembering that the United States came into its independence, into being in an era of revolutions across the, the, the Atlantic basin, if you will. And the most important of these, besides the American one, were those in Haiti, the uh, rebellion of enslaved black workers in the island of Haiti, uh, down here in the Caribbean, as you can see, uh, and then also the French Revolution, um, that unfolded in, in 1789 uh, and uh, turned France upside down and, and helped us bring on the Haitian Revolution uh, and both of which shaped their societies in much more radical directions uh, than the United States was by its revolution, at least right at the time. Now, in terms of partisanship, the American Revolution was inherently partisan. Right? It's, it's an international engagement and it's one in which Americans are fighting against other Americans, right? Because roughly a third of, of American colonists were loyalists to one degree or another. That is, they didn't think of themselves as, as Americans. They were loyal subjects of the British crown, uh, just as the patriots who were doing the rebelling had long thought of themselves also as, as having been loyal subjects until relatively recently. So you might think of these loyalists in the American Revolution as the first kind of un-Americans when you hear, start hearing that language in the Cold War with Joseph McCarthy and whether or not people are un-American or not. Well, I mean, the loyalists, I guess, were the first un-Americans. would be one way to think about it. Pretty fundamental split here over foreign relations, or really the split is over whether this is even about foreign relations or if it's an internal British imperial problem from the loyalist point of view by a bunch of disloyal neighbors. Now, the 1790s are then spent after the revolution succeeds and the Constitution establishes the United States as we know it today. The 1790s are spent by uh, American policymakers and elites uh, in trying to avoid being drawn into the British-French rivalry that continues around the globe and in Europe and into the on and off wars that lasted until Napoleon's defeat in 1815 and started the century from 1815 up to World War I in 1914, that we often think of as the Pax Britannica, sort of British-dominated relative peacefulness of Europe in those years, uh, in the, that 100-year period. So the U.S. is always trying to stay out of these other conflicts in its early history, and it tends to fail. And that's because different Americans have different views about this. Right? So there is partisanship all the way through. And in, uh, in the case of this struggle with, with the English uh, in the British Empire, this emerges again in really dramatic fashion by 1812 and the, the beginning of the War of 1812, uh, which is essentially a refighting of the American Revolution uh, to assert American independence and American autonomy uh, against impressment by the British Navy of American sailors, the seizing of American sailors on American ships in the Atlantic Ocean and impressing them into duty for the British Navy. Uh, and, and, and it also was a response by Americans to uh, trade challenges that the British Empire and especially the British Navy made to American uh, ships and commercial ships. And it was about conflicts on the northern border, particularly up here in the Great Lakes region, because, of course, this is British Canada to the north. And uh, there were conflicts over forts, the British forts on American uh, uh, borders, as well as uh, British um, close relations with in Native Americans who were not happy about the impinging reality of white settlers from the uh, new United States coming into their traditional lands. So all of this stimulates the conflict of the War of 1812 uh, and leads to, uh, a, well, two and a half years of war, during which the question of partisanship again comes up in a really dramatic fashion because the Federalists based in New England, and again, you can see that here and how this voting went in 1812, tended to have warmer views of the British and tended to want closer ties with the British. 
And so they eventually, a, a bunch of the particularly emphatically pro-British elements in New England, put together a series of, you know, of uh, delegates who met at, at Hartford in 1814 in this convention that was a way of thinking about ultimately about whether or not to stay in the United States as it was constructed. So that was a, you know, another dramatic example of exactly this kind of problem of, of how to, to keep domestic differences of opinion and policy uh, under control or in, inside the US when in fact they kept spilling over into international affairs. Now you could see this by 1823, 10 years later, again, we sort of swoop out to 30,000 feet, and then we're going to swoop back in. Because at the Monroe Doctrine, you have a declaration by President James Monroe uh, of a, a, a sort of announcement that the whole Western Hemisphere, not just North America, but the whole Western Hemisphere is now off limits to colonization, further colonization by Europeans. That with all the revolutions and independence that have unfolded southward from the United States, that this is gone. This is a, a Imperialism is not going to carry on from Europe anymore. And this is effective because of the British Navy, a confluence of American and British interests by the 1820s. Uh, but it's going to lay down a kind of way of thinking about the US as needing to be separate from the Europeans above all else, not, not from the rest of its neighbors in the, in the Western Hemisphere, but certainly from Europeans. And this is a fairly popular doctrine. Um, it, in fact, it helps to initiate a period that historians used to call the era of good feelings, which is, you know, suggests the fact that there was an absence of partisan rancor that was unusual uh, rather than, than uh, typical in the, uh, the American past. Now, the story of the 19th century is really one of growth across the continent of uh, a, a path to global power, which lay in transcontinental expansion and conflicts, of course, uh, across this, this land into lands that were um, controlled and had been historically uh, populated by other peoples. The first of these um, was especially the war with Mexico, and which was a partisan and a regional initiative, and in particular uh, led by James Polk. It was a Southern, uh, and a, a project with particular Southern enthusiasm for the spread of slavery into lands that had been held by Mexico, leading with Texas, which had gained its independence just uh, 10 years earlier from, from Mexico as the, one of the northernmost provinces of Mexico. And uh, this was the sort of language of the, what was then the Democratic Party and its heavily Southern orientation uh, and what was called manifest destiny, quote unquote, the idea that the United States was to go back for just a minute here as you can see that it was destined somehow to be in a manifest way to spread across the continent all the way to the Pacific. And that there's something sort of natural about these lines of, of division between on the, the borders of the North and the South elements of the United States. And of course, they're not natural at all. They're constructed over time and through very concrete political and military maneuvers. Now, um, the US war with uh, Mexico creates Great suspicion on the part of Northern, especially New England Whigs. Uh, they're suspicious of the slave states. They, are, they tend to be anxious about uh, the economics of slavery, the culture of slavery. Uh, they're part of a significant anti-war faction that was opposed to aggressive war that tried to put through unsuccessfully a proviso in Congress by David Wilmo, a Pennsylvanian, uh, to, to make sure that any territories taken in this war would not uh, allow, be allowed to have slavery in them. It's worth noting that Mexico itself had banned slavery in the course of the 1820s after its independence from Spain and the early 1830s. Uh, so, so this was a live question in these regions. But the quick victory of the American forces in the war against Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 uh, was followed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which reopened the possibility of slavery again north of the old uh, uh, Missouri Compromise line. That was the southern border of Missouri. It threw off the, the sort of the compromise of 1850, helped to create the Republican Party in 1854 as an anti-slavery party, and took us directly into the Civil War. Now, the Civil War is an interesting piece of this story because you'd think a civil war is supposed to be internal. That's what it is, right? It's civil. It's not a, a regular war against another power. But in fact, it's going to 
be connected to international affairs in ways that are impossible to, to prevent. And in this case, it had to do with trade, right? Which is that the American South was a huge producer of cotton and the mills of uh, the English Midlands were the central manufacturing uh, uh, production site for textiles made out of that cotton. So the relationship of, of the English economy to the American Southern economy was intimate. And you can see here on this map that there is a, a Union naval blockade, uh, which is running around the entire South through the Atlantic and into the Gulf of Mexico. Any of you who remember being uh, forced to watch Gone with the Wind, for example, remember that Rhett Butler was famous for being a blockade runner, one of the key figures in that film. Uh, and this blockade was an effort to try to keep, uh, to cut off that trade with England. And the question was whether England might actually recognize the Confederacy. And by early 1863, that's a live issue um, because it looks like the Confederacy is going to be able to hold itself separate. And it's the defeat at, um, at Gettysburg that really turns the, the course of the war and also turns back the idea of international recognition for the Confederacy as a separate nation, a crucial step toward the end of the Civil War and toward not having a repeat of, say, the French role in American history during the American Revolution. Uh, we don't get a repeat of that in the Civil War. Now, what unfolds after the Civil War, of course, is um, a long and rapid pattern of industrialization in American history, of urbanization, of widespread, large-scale European uh, immigration, particularly from Southern and Eastern Europe. And it's a story of economic expansion. Uh, the US is a booming country in these years, uh, and one that is marked by continuous violent warfare against indigenous peoples by the expanding American settlements and the military that comes to defend those settlers as they move on to previously Native American lands and a whole series of, of conflicts. Uh, that set of conflicts is going to continue on out into the Pacific here in the Philippines in the 1890s and 1898, as the US goes to war with Spain and seizes control of the Philippines, as well as seizing control of Puerto Rico and, and annexing Hawaii along the way. And this is often considered a, a crucial turning point in American history, the, the development of an overseas empire. The last generation or two of historians have been much, myself among them, have been much more dubious about that. We're much more inclined instead to see the American pattern of expansion into the West and its treatment of indigenous peoples as very similar in its uh, tactics and methods and institutions uh, as what happened overseas in places like the Philippines and then later in all kinds of uh, anti-insurgent warfare from, from Korea to Vietnam, uh, as we will come back to. So what happens in the Philippines is, is uh, interesting for our question of partisanship or bipartisanship because the U.S. quickly defeats the Spanish forces there, but then falls out rather rapidly with its uh, indigenous allies, its Filipino allies, who had already been trying to throw off Spanish rule, uh, led by uh, Emilio Aguinaldo, and thought the Americans were coming in to help free them. And when the Americans decided to stick around and keep control of the Philippines, uh, that quick that alliance quickly turned into a, an insurgent campaign of warfare that lasted for at least three years, and elements of it really lasted out until 1906 or so. Now, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in the United States at the time about taking the Philippines, because this looked awfully like old-fashioned European overseas colonial expansion, imperialism in its purest sense. It looked exactly like what the English had done in the original 13 colonies. And so a lot of Americans were uneasy about this. So you have dissent and you have serious partisan conflict over this issue. Um, although, again, the, the dissent tends to come on both the left and the right side. Uh, on the left side, for example, you'll see uh, Mark Twain here, um, who was a prominent anti-imperialist, who, who penned this famous uh, essay to the person sitting in darkness where he is satirically making fun of how white Americans disdained and looked down on Filipino peoples as supposedly uh, not prepared for independence and for self-government. But there were many other uh, 
anti-imperialists who also lost in the struggle to not annex the Philippines, but other dissenters, and they were on the right end of the political spectrum. They were particularly white Southern Democratic leaders, capital D Democratic, who were deeply anxious about absorbing all these non-white peoples in the Philippine Islands, which were densely populated, just as they are today. In fact, Manila in 1899 was, I think I have this right, the sixth largest American city because it was an American city after the U.S. annexed it. Which, and the U.S. held the Philippines until 1946. So it's 47 years of as American status. The U.S. doesn't make it a state. It doesn't make it a permanent uh, a commonwealth or territory like we do with uh, Puerto Rico, but it is an American territory. And I think if you had put the Philippines on a path to statehood, uh, the population would have produced, I think it was about 30 or 31 members of the House of Representatives from the Philippines, which again, white Southern segregationists in 1899 were not eager to have joining them in the American Congress. So you could see dissent on both sides of this issue, even though the US does go on to annex the Philippines for complicated reasons, much of it having to do with trade with China and keeping access to China, uh, because the Philippines are very close by there. Um, so you can see again, partisanship and dissent in all kinds of directions here. Now, the real turning point in American relations with the rest of the world comes with the Great War. I mean, it couldn't be World War I when there wasn't a World War II yet. So it was known as the Great War because it was the first in 100 years, this first major war, a full scale, fully mobilized, open ended between the great powers of this era, which were European powers. And World War I was devastating because it was industrialized. It was the first large scale international conflict using the horrific killing devices created by the Industrial Revolution, particularly machine guns, poison gas, flamethrowers. You began, you know, you, you get the use of tanks here, barbed wire. Barbed wire and machine guns are particularly important for the establishment of trench warfare because they're defensive techniques that made it very difficult for uh, attacking troops to avoid being mowed down. Um, it was really horrific in that sense. And the American response to the Great War is the interesting point because Americans responded by saying, that is craziness. This is tragedy and it's immoral. It's exactly what European imperial powers do. They compete with each other and they do it in order to grab more territory from each other. And it is a, it's a war that we have no part of. We have no cause to be part of this. And the American response was to remain neutral for the first three years of the war from 1914 to 1917. There's heavy support, both parties, for Woodrow Wilson's neutrality policy that tradition of being neutral, which modern Americans have a harder time thinking of as normal, like only referees are neutral and nobody likes the refs. Or, <laughs> oh, it, Americans are so used to being on one side or another in the 20th and 21st centuries that it, it's hard to remember just how much being neutral was considered a duty of a nation that was better than the other nations, that was not an imperial power, at least how Americans understood themselves, that was not an expansive, aggressive colonizing force in the world that was instead supposed to be a force for de democracy for self-government which is the opposite of empire so that that uh, neutrality policy carries on for the first three years of the war uh, especially as the war is revealed to be as horrific as it turns out to be as some of these images gives us at least a little bit of an impression there were also political reasons for the u.s to stay out of the war woodrow wilson in particular the democratic party filled with uh recent immigrants from, and relatively recent immigrants from of Irish descent, of German descent, who none of whom wanted to be involved in the war uh, against Germany or on the side of the uh, English who were great colonizers of Ireland, and Ireland didn't have its independence yet. Uh, uh, Americans from Russia, particularly Jewish Americans, had no desire to be on the side of Russia in this war. Uh, socialists, of course, thought of the war as one great capitalist crime of sending some workers out to kill other workers in the interests of the owners, the employers. The pacifists opposed the war. Progressives with a capital P in this era in both parties opposed the war. And Wilson was one of them. He ran for re-election in 1916 on the campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. And he wins 
you know, on that on the basis of that. Of course, it doesn't last. Submarine warfare by the Germans helps to drag the U.S. into the war, as does the really intensive economic connections that the U.S. has with the Europeans, um, uh, especially on the Allied side. And so the, the U.S. sends the American Expeditionary Force in uh, in 1917. Uh, they really get there in large numbers in 1918 and play a crucial role under John uh, Pershing, uh, General John Pershing, who, of course, had spent time here at the University of Nebraska running the, the equivalent of the ROTC program back then. We have a Pershing building on city campus uh, named after him. But this is the period of belligerency during which the U.S. is a combatant and helps to shape the very end of the war in particular and the German defeat there. There was dissent once again, and it came from both sides at home during that period of belligerency. Uh, Eugene Debs was a Christian socialist, much beloved and respected uh, across the political spectrum, actually, uh, but who is tried and found guilty under the Espionage Act passed in 1917 and locked up for, you know, uh, but given a 10 year sentence. But over on the other side, you had a Republican like Jeanette Rankin from uh, Montana, the first woman elected to the House of Representatives, and she uh, is the sole vote against going to war because she holds to that American tradition of seeing Europe's wars as spectacularly brutal and pointless, something for the U.S. to avoid, to be modeling a resistance to. Now, the war is going to end in 1918, and it's, you're going to have the peace treaty negotiated at, the, at Versailles uh, by Wilson here in the center, along with uh, Georges Clemenceau, the French president, and the British prime minister, David Lloyd George. Uh, they put together this uh, League of Nations that goes as part of the Versailles Treaty, emphasizing the idea of collective security, of a commitment ahead of time to the security of other nations as a way to discourage aggression in the international system. And this is rejected, ultimately, the League of Nations by the Republican members of the Senate at home. So again, partisanship kills a major uh, thrust of Wilson's efforts to develop a post-war world that would be more peaceful. Much of this has to do with Wilson's personality, his failure to negotiate ahead of time with Republicans, his, his tendency toward arrogance and, uh, and, and the sort of a heavy touch, heavy hand in politics rather than a light touch. But it also has to do with principles. I mean, uh, people in the Senate didn't like the idea of pre-committing the United States to the defense of other nations particularly in the case of some elements of the Treaty of Versailles, which had made uh, exchanges of land. So that Japan, for example, had, had access to parts of China, to the Shantung Peninsula, uh, that, that would now have to be defended by the United States as part of the League of Nations in principle here. So that kind of, uh, of accommodation to, of, to realpolitik made, made it hard for many uh, in the Republican wing of the of the Senate to accept the logic of collective security in the League of Nations. So the U.S. stays out of the League of Nations, but uh, and, and, and we used to talk about the 1920s as a period of isolationism, but that's not a very good description. Instead, the U.S. opts for something more like unilateral interventionism, I guess, or a, or a sort of maybe a, a kind of a unilateral um, autonomy. And this involved an awful lot of trade because um, the 1920s is the time when American automobiles are proliferating and being sent around the world, uh, as well as around American markets. And Hollywood movies are reshaping the entertainment and, and therefore the dream lives of, of people all around the globe. Uh, and there's also efforts, successful efforts, to reduce armaments in the Washington Conference of the early 1920s, uh, and, and in addition to this building of, of uh, extensive trade relations. So, the U.S. is deeply involved in the world, even when it's not politically involved. Now, you can see from some of these cartoons, the interwar years, the 20s, and then the very different 1930s and during the Depression, that, that, that American sensibilities were such that they looked down on Europeans with their many complaints at Versailles, having suffered through the war in ways Americans hadn't. They had a different view of it. You can imagine this cartoon didn't go over well among uh, European readers. Um, but then also here with uh, Uncle Sam, you know, regretting this European tendency to go to war with each other, again, seems by, the by 1939, uh, is seen as a, a European problem, something that, again, the U.S. should stay out of. You could see this in particular, uh, uh, with particular clarity in the 1930s. And that's because as 
Schism took force and took hold and, and in power in Italy from the 20s on, and then in, in uh, Germany from 1933 on under the Nazis. What you get is a pattern of aggressiveness that the US responds to with a series of neutrality acts from 1935 to 1936 to 1937, an effort keep the U.S. out of another war. If another major war does come in Europe, Americans are determined to stay out of it. So the very principles that took the United States into World War I, especially the principle of free free freedom of the seas, of being free of, for neutral ships to travel safely, uh, even during wartime, and freedom of trade with all sides, uh, of non-contraband goods, it was that those principles that helped pull the U.S. into World War I are now being given up in a determination to not be drawn into another huge, spectacular conflict that doesn't seem to solve problems and just seems to kill literally millions of people. And you can again see that in these cartoons, that, that sense of, of uh, resistance to what's happening in Europe, but also in the cartoon on the left, you know, uh, here you have a cartoonist sensibility, which is saying this is maybe not such a wise thing to remain out of this coming war. Where and the one on the right is a great, great little spoof of, doc, of the Dr. Zeus cartoonist. Um, you know, on exactly how effective or not this, the uh, aid to the Allies really was. Now, what happens, of course, is that neutrality acts only last so long, and uh, the U.S. is essentially at war with Germany in an undeclared way in the North. Atlantic as it convoys uh, British ships from 1939 to 1941, but it really goes directly into war when the U.S. is actually attacked here at Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941. And what this does, uh, you know, is is essentially unify the nation. There is there are some dissenters against World War II, but they're a tiny slice of people, and they have very little political cachet or power here uh, in a period of being actually attacked by fascist powers and imperialist powers. So this, uh, this story unfolds across World War II of a terrific victory at, at great cost on all sides, but particularly for the Allies, uh, for, the, for the Russians, um, the Soviets, and, and for the British and for the Americans, and one that America consolidated American power and consolidated an American presence overseas. So that by 1945, the US, had troops and ships on every continent and in on every ocean. And the US was the one truly global military force in the world, as well as, of course, the largest economy, uh, holding you know, over half of the world's gold by 1945, gold reserves, and, uh, and actually also producing more than half of its industrial goods by 1945, as the, the other major countries had been devastated by the fighting in a way the United States was not. So the US came out in a remarkably, relatively healthy fashion from World War II and in a, a way that, that made them much admired by other nations and, and somewhat envied by other nations as well. And it led to a pattern, of course, of the United States remaining overseas projecting its power overseas. And this had a great deal to do with the fact that the Soviet Union has also been victorious and had uh, found itself right there in the center of Europe at the end of the war against the Nazis, controlling Eastern Europe, much of Central Europe, and uh, ex expanding its influence soon after into China as well. So this struggle that begins at the end of World War II that we come to call the Cold War, a kind of capitalist versus communist or democratic capitalist versus communist uh, conflict is one that you would think would also reveal partisanship uh, in America and, and tensions over how to engage with this international story. In fact, this is an exception in some ways, the Cold War. It's a period when the degree of anxiety was so large in American life about the peacetime threat of communism winning a, an ideological struggle for the loyalties of the world's peoples, as well as a potential military conflict someday, that that degree of anxiety unified Americans in a way that happens when you're under attack. It happened in, with Pearl Harbor, and it's going to happen again with 9-11. When you're under attack from the outside, then your internal enemies seem less important and less threatening to you, at least briefly. <laughs> 
And in this case, what you saw was a Republican Party moving away from the isolationism of Robert Taft, the Republican senator from Ohio, who'd been a dominant figure on the right wing of the party, uh, and toward a very different perspective of uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, uh, the Republican from Michigan, who had been a strong supporter of those neutrality acts in the 1930s, but by 1946 and 1947, decides to work closely with Harry Truman the Democratic president in these early post-war years in fighting a Cold War against the Soviet Union and its influence and trying to contain its expansion elsewhere in the globe. Now, there were still, of course, splits in both parties, even in these periods of relative cohesion around a global, a perceived global threat here. And so in the Democratic Party, this took the form of the tensions between Roosevelt's likely successors, uh, Henry Wallace on the right, his vice president during his third term uh, here from 1941 to 45, and then Harry Truman, his subsequent vice president uh, for the first part of his uh, fourth uh, term in office before he dies and, and uh, Roosevelt and Truman takes over for him. Henry Wallace instead is going to, it represents the left edge of the Democratic Party. Uh, Truman represents something more like the right or to center of that party. And uh, he's going to wind up, in a sense, kind of baiting Henry Wallace and the Progressive Party, as it's called, that, that redevelops in 1947 and 48 for the election in 1948, which is and because Henry Wallace is supported by the very small American Communist Party. And so he is seen as far too soft on communism. And Truman spends a lot of the late 1940s trying to isolate Wallace and trying to isolate uh, those who would be progressives or democratic socialists in the American political system. Some historians have even referred to this as Trumanism, as a kind of play on McCarthyism, a kind of you know, trying to declare somebody as off limits, as outside, uh, as canceled, to use our modern term, somebody you shouldn't listen to. Truman does a good bit of that in order to try to inoculate the himself and the Democratic Party against this guy, as it turns out. Joseph McCarthy, the junior senator Republican from Wisconsin, who as uh, one of the more astute observers in the early 1950s when McCarthy was at the height of his influence as a communist hunter, uh, referred to him as a person who, he said Joseph McCarthy couldn't find a communist in Red Square if he tried, which is a great way to think about it. Because McCarthy was a person who seized upon the anti-communist issue and made hay of it in a way that he hadn't had no prior record for and no real interest in. It was simply a, a political tool to beat uh, liberals, but particularly the Democratic Party with, um, as a whip to beat them with in political terms, so that uh, to try to move voters toward the Republican Party. McCarthy is very successful from 1950 to 1953 during the Korean War. Those are great years because the U.S. is at war with communists, and communist troops are killing American troops on the peninsula in Korea. And that makes Americans, you know, enraged and anxious. And so McCarthy plays on that successfully. But once uh, Dwight Eisenhower is elected in 1952, a Republican president, uh, then McCarthy is not so useful to the Republican Party as an attack dog because they don't want him attacking the executive branch, the, the army, the FBI, the Justice Department, as he, as he had begun to. Uh, he was sort of out of control from their point of view. And he's, by 1954, he's going to actually be censored by his Senate colleagues uh, for having gone too far. The Democrats have their own version of this, though, and it comes out in the Vietnam War, dissent within the party, because the party has, has very conservative elements and very left-leaning elements. And then Lyndon Johnson, who's a, a pretty liberal person in his domestic politics, is going to take the U.S. into the combat phase of the war with U.S. combat troops. And that's going to happen only there in... Um, in 1965, uh, in the midst of this long, longer struggle of the U.S. supporting anti-communist forces in Vietnam. And so the, the, the Democratic Party by 1968, uh, as many of you will know, wound up pulling itself apart at the Democratic Convention in Chicago that year. Uh, as you had anti-war forces, pro-war forces, and even forces who thought that Johnson wasn't going far enough, that he should have been using nuclear weapons on the communists in North Vietnam, for example. So both, so partisanship, you know, is one way to think about these years, but there's also dissent within the parties. There's serious, uh, a serious range of views being expressed here. 
For the rest of the Cold War, there is the ongoing problem of authoritarianism on the right in the developing world or what was known at the time as the third world. Uh, and a, 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 on the other hand, a kind of a revolutionary forces on the left uh, in much of this third world sphere in places like Iran and Guatemala or Congo and Cuba or Vietnam itself, Chile, South Africa, Nicaragua, a whole series of conflicts between that became sort of uh, touchstones of Cold War uh, tensions between the US and the Soviet Union. Uh, and these tended to produce some bipartisanship at home in support of them around Cuba, for example. That, that's not an issue that the, the parties differ from each other a lot on, a little bit in emphasis, but not a lot. The Republicans generally position themselves as sort of the daddy party, if you want to think of it that way, as the more militarized, more using tougher language uh, against uh, communism. Whereas the Democrats are often seen as kind of the mommy party to use the old sort of sexist language about uh, taking concern for the health and welfare of American citizens and less concerned about about communist threats from abroad. But, you know, you might notice that the Democrats are the people who are in power who wage World War I under Woodrow Wilson, World War II under, under uh, Franklin Roosevelt or the Vietnam War under Lyndon Johnson. Right? I mean, all of these are, are wars run by the Democrats, not by the Republicans. Now, the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union, of course, by in 1989 leads to the demise of the external empire of uh, Eastern Europe, the Eastern Bloc, and the internal empire of those nations that have gained their independence, as we know, particularly these days with all the attention to Ukraine. Uh, and what this does, of course, the end of the Soviet Union is to end the socialist option. It's an amazing defeat of the great socialist alternative to capitalism. Even the nations that remain officially communist, like China or, or uh, Vietnam in particular, both begin to use market mechanisms and function much more like market Leninists, as they're sometimes called in a joking sense. Now, the end of the Soviet Union also meant a decline in American interest in the Cold War, in foreign relations, in, uh, you know, in, in external things. And at the time, I was teaching at Cornell University when the Cold War ended. I was just at, at the end of my first semester there, December of 1991, when the Soviet Union implodes and redistributes itself into its previous republics. And what was fascinating to me over the next many years was the decline in enrollments in my large foreign policy lecture classes, which had started at about 250 students in 1991 and declined steadily over the next 10 years. And I thought, oh my gosh, I am really not very good at this, well, which may have been true. But it also turned out that Cornell students, like students at any other university, were worried about making money. They were interested in Wall Street. They were focused on different things. Uh, and the foreign relations just seemed less important with the big threat of communism gone. And then, of course, what happens is September 11th. And suddenly, the numbers in my course went shooting back up foreign relations. And I thought, oh, OK, it's not all me. It's a very encouraging moment, but a horrific moment, of course, for the United States and for much of the world. And what this did, the 9-11 attacks in 2001 turned American attention back to international affairs in ways that they've been trying to avoid. Remember what I said at the beginning, that most Americans don't really think a lot about international affairs until they're sort of forced to. And here they were forced to. And this opened up the question of, uh, of Islamism, of radical Islam or political Islam. Uh, and you can see from this distribution of uh, Sunni and Shia Muslims throughout the, the scale of the Muslim majority uh, countries and sphere of the world. And the one Islamist government that had been established successfully had been in 1979, of course, in Iran, which had become a major problem for American foreign relations. Topic for a separate lecture. But the other one was in Afghanistan, the Taliban in the 1990s. Uh, and they were the folks who, of course, gave uh, uh, care, comfort and accommodation to Osama bin Laden. They were longtime allies from the struggle back in the 80s against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, and that's where the attacks are, are sort of run from uh, by Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan. So instead, we have this new challenge of, of a non state actor and how to respond to that. It's very different than dealing with a nation that has to worry about defending its own peoples. And Al-Qaeda didn't have that concern. 
So the U.S., you know, puts together a quick campaign under George W. Bush as a pretty new president to overthrow the Taliban in Afghanistan, working closely hand in hand with the Northern Alliance of anti-Taliban forces right there in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and then also the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in Iraq in 2003. Now, the first of these is widely popular with bipartisan support, and the second is widely unpopular. Well, that's not, that's a little strong. It has a lot of popular support, but there's significant mainstream dissent against the attack uh, on Iraq because Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11, had nothing to do with Islamism. The Islamists hated Saddam, in fact, as a, as a secular um, figure who they disliked. He was also an Alawite, which is a minor, a minor uh, slice of the Muslim distribution in the world who were closely connected to the Shias rather than the Sunnis and the Taliban were, were very, and, and Al-Qaeda, very uh, purist Sunni revolutionaries. So there's a, there's a kind of a, bi, a, a, a way in which you had some bipartisanship and, and then some partisanship in the struggles of the early 2000s. Now, to pop back up to the 30,000 foot level again and briefly bring us up to the present, let's let's slip over here to 2016. I'm sorry, I don't mean to trauma. I should have a trigger warning for a photo like this, depending on the audience, I suppose. I hope I'm getting at least a small smile from somebody. A trigger warning for either left or right, um, you know, depending on how it goes. But what's interesting about the 2016 election in terms of foreign policy and partisanship or bipartisanship is how much it opens up Oh, serious questions about what are U.S. interests in the world. And this had not previously been seriously examined. Sanders does this in some ways, but maybe more so on domestic issues. But Trump, who's mostly known for his attitude on domestic stuff, on foreign relations, was so uh, nationalist in his perspective and so uninterested in the rest of the world and so transactional in his view of the world, as you all know, um, that that this raised questions for the first time really since before the Cold War about what was the U.S. actually doing out in the world? What were its interests? Was it, was it in American interest to have tens of thousands of troops in South Korea, for example, or in Germany? And these were interesting questions finally being raised. This was the upside of the Trump years, I suppose. You can think of it in foreign policy. Again, both parties were revealed now in 2016 to have nationalist wings and globalist wings. There, this is true across both parties, and it's a better description than to think of it as partisan differences. And this is true as we slide forward into the current issues that are before us that you'll be dealing with in this class in more detail. And in particular here, uh, the business of holding NATO together and supporting Ukraine against the devastating and horrific ongoing slaughter of Ukrainian civilians by an unprovoked uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian imperial and colonialist force trying to seize control of Ukraine. Uh, and, and so how the U.S. has responded to this is in some ways a throwback to the Cold War because it's it's leaning on, uh, on its alliance with NATO and standing up to Russian, in this case, as opposed to Soviet aggression, Russia being at the heart of the old Soviet Union. Uh, and it raises the issue of China and, what, uh, and this whole issue of how Taiwan is going to manage its future and how China will manage the future of Taiwan, which is a very open one that you'll be dealing with in detail later in the series. One other key issue coming at us, of course, is immigration and the southern U.S. border. It's an issue that's always there hasn't gone away. It ebbs and flows in American consciousness. It's Again, you have differences within the parties about this issue, although as the parties have become more ideologically separate, more conservative and more for the Republicans and more liberal for the Democrats, although again, I think those terms are, are confusing and misleading in some ways, um, immigration has begun to take on a kind of different cast depending on the party. So here you can have real partisan differences as opposed to bipartisanship on an issue, again, immigration, that is an international relations issue, uh, even if we didn't used to think of it in those terms. Finally, the last big one, of course, is climate change. And it's the big one that we're going to be, because I'm guessing all of you out there, though I can't see you, tend to be closer to my age than the age of my students at the university, that we are going to be leaving for the generations to come after us. And what climate change has done you know, and again, in terms of this question of partisanship and bipartisanship, is it has redefined what security and national security might actually mean. But the problem is it's doing it slowly enough 
that it doesn't have the immediacy of a crisis of a, of a snowstorm or a, you know a, a natural disaster or a terrorist attack or a, a, from abroad or a terrorist attack in Washington D.C. against the U.S. Capitol or you know any, any way you want to think about what makes people react quickly. The problem here is it's the frog in the pan. It's the water heating up but not heating up fast enough to move the frog out. And that's where we are currently, of course. And we're distracted by polarized politics in this regard. And we're also distracted, I think, by the entertainment culture, which is typified for young people by TikTok. But, you know, it's the endless digital options that you would have had tonight if you had uh, been not been so disciplined as to be part of this conversation, but instead had gone on to you know, the, million, the, the myriad entertainments and pleasures of Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the rest of it. And another key piece of this is that the, the Republican Party has, until now at least, uh, has played a role of, of sort of muddying the waters about the degree and speed of climate change. And this has been uh, particularly in part because of the petroleum industry's strong funding and lobbying uh, of Republican members of Congress in particular in this regard. And the very fact that so many major figures in the, in the oil and gas industry have been involved in American politics at the elite level, George Bush and Dick Cheney being the most obvious recent examples. But the Republican Party has moved on this, and it's important to note this, that what was a lot of denialism until a couple of years ago is now more a matter of not so much denying as sort of trying to downplay a little bit the reality. But I noticed that even this morning's newspaper headline in the Omaha World Herald is growing threat, climate change already impacting Nebraskans' health. You know, so that's not exactly denial here in the very mainstream of, Amer of, of one of the more conservative states in the union. The Democratic Party, for its part, you know, is divided on this issue. Not like the, not, not, seriously divided, but they're divided in terms of how much emphasis to put on it, because the Democrats tend to be a big umbrella as a party. Nonetheless, as a party, they have managed to pass under the Biden administration, this Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, as well as the CHIPS and, and uh, Science Act, all of which are dramatically uh, encouraging through innovative funding techniques and tax breaks, a whole set of green technologies that are already reshaping the landscape of energy production, of carbon burning, whether it's happening fast enough or not, that's another, that's another question, right? That's, that's the challenge, that's the opportunity for us. But climate change is, is here, whether we want it or not, and how quickly we can react to it is, is the great challenge for us. It's the ultimate test of bipartisanship uh, on a global level uh, against a global threat. So let me stop there and uh, and see if I can get uh, Peter or uh, maybe Ben back up here to uh, if I can pop out of this screen sharing uh, and see if we have some questions and comments to get a little input. Well, Tim, thank you so much. I was just mesmerized by your, your presentation and I hope that the other 90 people were as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over actually to uh, Bob, our, our tech guy, who is going to read uh, any questions or comments from the chat that are relevant, and then we'll open it up. Uh, he'll take control from here on out, and then uh, we'll open it up to uh, people who would like to unmute and uh, and ask a question or, or make a comment themselves, and we'll try to keep pretty close to the 8.30 deadline that we promised everybody. So I'm going to go off the video and mute and turn it over to Bob Fusen. Great. Um, we've only got one question in the chat, so I'll read that one and let Tim respond. And uh, then I will give everybody the ability to turn their video on and unmute and ask questions. And then we'll uh, have a little Q&A until 830. So the question in the chat is, what do you think of viewing immigration as part of the frog in the pan, the south to the north migration? to the US and Europe to escape drought, conflict over resources and poverty. Wow, well, it's a great question. It's absolutely crucial. And it used to be that diplomatic history didn't have to cover this. You know, we used to sort of pretend that immigration was a separate issue. But the link that you're, is being drawn here by the question uh, of immigration patterns to climate change is particularly critical. 
it's one of the many ways that you know that climate change is already with us and is shaping the world in ways that we're not paying enough attention to, with the exception of people such as the one asking this question. Uh, my old colleague from Cornell, Maria Cristina Garcia, has just published a terrific book about this with UNC Press. I'm spacing the title of it right now, um, but it's about climate change as, as a key to understanding current immigration pattern, current migration patterns, movement across national borders, especially into the United States. But as your questioner is also suggesting, this is a huge problem or challenge on the European side of, thing, of the Atlantic as well, where you have a terrific amount of migration that is climate change driven out of the Middle East and out of Central and West Africa. Also, especially with, with desertification, you know, with drying out and the loss of, of uh, uh, fertile soil. Um, and you've had people losing land or unable to make the livings they used to be able to make in places from Afghanistan, you know, to Sierra Leone. And these are the folks who were, who were part of that huge uh, sweep of, uh, and wave of migrants into Europe out of Africa and the Middle East in 2015, as well as still since then. It's also the same story with, um, with people out of Central America. There are so many factors that are driving people out of places like Honduras and Guatemala. Nicaragua, but these are amplified by climate change. It's in ways that we haven't even begun to really grasp. And it's speeding up in ways that are going to shock a lot of people, I think, just as the drying out of the American Southwest is speeding up in ways that amaze those of us who watch people still move to Arizona and New Mexico, which are places I love. But I, I can't imagine buying property in places that are as dry as they are. And, with the Colorado River, you know, in serious danger. So the future on this, you know, I, I mean, I, as a citizen, I see just the same thing that this terrific questioner is asking. You know, what, where do we go with this? How do we do this? Immigration itself is a, is a, you know, a vast problem. But honestly, I feel that it's one where partisanship gets in the way of solutions of finding the common ground that does exist. And I feel like the exact same thing is true on abortion and many other issues where the exaggeration of people on each end of this tend to mask some of the public policy that could help to solve the problem. So just to be clear about this on abortion, that would mean serious sex education and serious uh, access to, to um, uh, you know, to contraception, et cetera, you know, all of which can reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies. And that would be an easy thing for both sides to work at um, as opposed to absolute bans. Um, regardless of where you stand on this issue, that's sort of common ground, it seems like. And the same with immigration, where it feels like uh, the idea of trying to build walls to keep everybody out is, uh, you know, is really problematic in a nation that's built on immigration, that's desperately in need of more people to fund social security and medicare as well as to fill the jobs that we have all over lincoln you know and everywhere else in the country um, but you know that do reflect at the same time real concerns about how migration works you know and questions of flows of drugs and flows of terrorism and such i mean border control is a real issue it's not pretend in the in the modern era but i, I feel like in a if we as a country if we work as a like a family might actually try to solve these things together, it would be an awesome business because there could be solutions. That's my little tiny bit of optimism. Uh, Tim, we had one more question come across the chat asking about uh, periods of broad agreement, World War II, containment of communism, activism, activism against radical Islamists. Yeah, those are, those are great examples. Um, and I touched on them too briefly, and I appreciate the the question about them. There's part of the reason that I that I emphasize the the degree of dissent that is going on even during those periods within the parties as well as between parties uh, is that we have a certain tendency toward you know alumni syndrome about earlier periods of history that we think were better than they are today and were better in some ways in terms of national unity or less partisanship or less you know insulting of other people or you know a greater sense of community connection and spirit those things are are serious and real but we have to be careful about that sort of nostalgia problem 
uh, cause it's, it's a, it, it can be misleading about exactly how divided we have been in the past, and, you know, and, and, and a lot of other things in the past that we tend to downplay when we think fondly of our younger years or something, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm, and also this, I guess the very idea that what you, what produces unity are these spectacular assaults or wars or devastating conflicts that are, you know, that kill tons of people. I mean, what a way to be brought together. You know, it feels, it feels like such a, an awful, a true, but, uh, but awfully sad way to be unified. Yeah. All right, we got a couple more in the chat. Is human population still the largest elephant in the room? Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, it is, of course, because we're running an uncontrolled scientific experiment. And I wish I could pop on the screen here a, a graph of human population growth over time. But if I did, what you would see is a line running, you know, right along the bottom of very low human population, you know, a few million members of our species, Homo sapiens, for hundreds of thousands of years. And then you'd see this dramatic increase with industrialization starting at, you know, right around the time the United States gets formed, 1780s, 1790s. And this, and it rockets upward to where we are today, which is 8.1 billion people or whatever, and still climbing. Now, the growth rate has slowed down, which is good. Uh, and but the numbers are still going to go up. We don't know nine and a half billion or ten billion, or whatever. I mean, but we are definitely running an uncontrolled experiment to see how much the Earth can handle this many of us, particularly this many of us burning carbon and you know engaging in our modern, very comfortable, very convenient lifestyle, which is one that few of us would want to give up. But of course, that's our our challenge. So the the, the inequality in this, the problem as an international relations issue with this is sort of how to manage the transition to alternative energies, but also to the question of, did the early industrializers get the advantage and get to spew the much carbon they wanted to and have this much better life, while the later industrializers now get criticized for what these folks didn't get criticized for, the Europeans, the North Americans, didn't get in the Japanese didn't get criticized for in the same way that the Chinese and the Indians are today uh, and the rest of the developing world if you will so that's an interesting problem of of managing sort of it's not exactly social justice but it is a sense of historical responsibility and shared responsibility and how to do that that's that's an interesting problem but population is a huge issue and I, I uh, I, I give congratulations for that question. Another one from the chat. Do you think we can unite in support of Ukraine? Boy, we have. It's fantastic. Just fantastic. I mean, uh, it's been an amazing thing to watch. Yes, there are some, a few elements who get a lot of attention on the right wing of the Republican members of the House of Representatives. They have very little influence. Uh, except at Fox News or, you know, whatever. They may have more influence over the core better at seeing the future than any of the rest of us. But I can say that the American response in helping to lead the support for Ukraine has been deeply encouraging to anybody who thinks Ukraine should be supported and that invading other nations unprovokedly and killing their civilians randomly and torturing them is a horrific thing to be prevented. Whether or not the U.S. should be doing more is a wide open question and one that I'm pretty sympathetic to, although militarization is always a problem. But in this case, you've got a full scale war going on already. Um, so I'm, I, I think the Biden administration is going to look very good uh, from a historical backward looking view in another five or 10 years over how its leadership of NATO in this regard. It's, it's amazing to think about what it would have been like had, the Trump, had there been a second Trump administration. Because it certainly would not have, the war in Ukraine could not have had the same outcome in the same way that it has. That's an amazing alternative history to think about, sobering. 
All right, from the chat, uh, trade and commerce drive American foreign policy. So why has America so neglected trade with South America and the Caribbean and focused on places where other countries have the advantage? Well, now this is the historian of me speaking. U.S. trade with an investment in the Western Hemisphere was much larger than it was across the oceans for most of the first 150 years of American history. In other words, the US was really focused on the Circum Caribbean in particular, partly because it was strategically, you know, securing its southern flank, but also because it essentially colonized much of the Caribbean and, and Central America. And I think today it's worth noting, just I, I don't mean to disagree with the question entirely because it's a, it's actually an interesting and a good one but you know Mexico and Canada have historically been the two largest trading partners of the United States only in the last 10 years did China wedge its way into there and become the the other largest uh, trading partner but in other words the US has been very focused on its neighbors and, and trade with its neighbors um although you know, the capitalists don't like borders. I mean, I mean, that's if you run a corporation or run a business, you're trying to do business with everybody. You know, you're not really interested in what they look like or where they live. The question is who can buy your goods or who can sell you the things you need, goods or natural materials, um, you know, and at what price. And so, those, you know, those concerns are, I mean, I think from a capitalist perspective, a lot of it is all pretty much doesn't matter to them, you know. But I think the Western Hemisphere has gotten an awful lot of attention for the United States. The other key piece is who are the wealthiest markets for selling American goods? And there, the issue has been that Europe, Europeans have been far and away the most important markets for most of American history for selling American products to. Um, this is true of agricultural products and you know, finished manufacturing goods. Uh, this, it's then true that East Asia would be the next wealthiest part of the world for purchasing stuff. So some of it is about market stuff. And of course, the US market is always the biggest, at least since 1913, has been the biggest market in the world. Uh, and so everybody wants to sell in the US, starting with American manufacturers and American farmers themselves. Yeah, this is one of the distinctive things about the United States that people sometimes forget. It's sort of like that population question a minute or two ago, uh, that the United States is distinctive in world. Uh, it's It's not better than or worse than any other nation in this sense. It's just different in the sense that it's the third largest nation in population terms on, on Earth after China and India. But it is also the only one of the largest nations that is so thoroughly industrialized and so wealthy. So to have such a large economy and so much wealth with so many people in it, such a large middle class, despite all the downward pressure on the middle class and the in economic inequality today, the U.S. still has a vast middle class market, and and it's very different. So the next, you know, to get to a nation that has similar buying power on a per capita basis from the United States, you got to go all the way down to, I guess Japan, maybe at 130,000 people. So that's like you know, maybe 35 percent the size of the United States roughly, you know, and then Germany comes after that as the population gets smaller. And I mean, you're, you gotta go down to a lot. The US is just peculiar because it's so darn big and so rich on a per capita basis, even with unequal distribution of that, of that GDP. All right, in the interest of time, Tim, we've got two last questions in the chat here. Okay. Um, the first one, can you kindly comment on the role of social media in the context of bipartisan politics? Man, that's a great question. When I look at my 18 to 21 year old students every day, I worry about this all the time. And I, I, uh, I'm immensely grateful that my own kids are 27 and 31 and not 17 and 21, much less seven and 11. That's not much of an answer though. The question, the, the, what we've discovered is that social media has had a lot of different effects and, and some of them are positive. I think, you know, you, you got to be clear about that. And I'm, and I'm not going to go into all of that. We don't have time. But in terms of partisanship, it, it has clearly made, had the result that 
people talk to other people who are like them. And it's easier to do that. And the algorithms of the various social media outlets push people in that direction, Facebook and TikTok and all the rest of them, um, you know, so that you wind up in not in a conversation like we people of my generation would remember when there were just three television stations, right? When there were not cable networks yet, much less the, the internet, where you at least had a sort of common sense of what the events of the day were, even if you disagreed about things quite vigorously. There was a kind of common ground and a, neat, and a tendency to have some conversations with people you didn't necessarily agree with. And I think social media has made it a lot easier for people not to do that. And, and that's unfortunate. I mean, as a, as a continued uh, element in accelerating, exacerbating polarization. Yeah. All right, we have time for one last question. And this is from the chat. It seems that the world economy, human interests, and climate change, et cetera, has become a debating point rather than a talking point. Have we unfortunately made this more political in all countries than humanitarian? I missed the beginning. This is about climate change? Um, yeah, I'll repeat it. It seems that the world economy, human interests, and climate change, et cetera, has become a debating point rather than a mm -hmm. talking point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we unfortunately made this more political than humanitarian? Hmm. Yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> we have. Uh, personally, I, I'll, I'll end with an appeal here, really, which is that I left the Ivy League to come to Nebraska. I had no connection to Nebraska or the middle, middle, the Midwest or you know the Great Plains at all. It was the only part of the U.S. I'd never lived in. But for me, it was a, a chance to go talk to different people with some different perspectives, rather than the kind of standard liberal suburban ethics that ethos that dominates in the Ivy League world. And being at Nebraska has really allowed that to happen, just because there's a little more diversity here of people from left to right, uh, and then my students as well. And so, so I, I think talking to people who you disagree with is just like the most important thing in the world. They're the only people you learn from, right? You gotta have, you have friends to talk to who you agree with because they pat you on the back and make you feel good about what you already think. But we learn from the people we disagree with. I mean, and those are people, we gotta hold them close. The people gotta have friends we don't, you know, that we don't see eye to eye with all the time on everything. Now, that translates in response to the question to saying that that pressure for, for not having talking points at each other so much as having pressure to actually manage problems, to do serious policy making is the kind of pressure that we should be pushing on our political leaders of whatever party they're in. Yeah. Tim, that, that's great. Uh, it's a shame we have to cut this off, but it's good for you that we have to cut this off so you can go on with your, with your life. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for this. Uh, I want to tell you, and this is a credit to your presentation, that we usually have had 50 to 60 people when we had the in-person uh, lectures stay for the Q&A. Uh, I we had 75 out of 90 stay for the Q&A, and I think that's a testament uh, to uh, to the draw of your presentation. So thank well, you. Thank you well, again. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, I, I think I should note that they're gluttons for punishment, uh, yeah. and I'm deeply honored. I'm just delighted. The questions are excellent, and I just wish we could carry on because I just love the conversation. I'm I'm really just very pleased to be part well, we of it. We will carry thank on uh, next week when we we listened to Megan Green from the University of Kansas talk about uh, China, Taiwan, and the U.S. response to that. So I hope we'll all be back. We'll tell our friends, and we'll have an even larger group to continue the series. So thank you all, and, and thanks, Bob, and, and good night to everyone.